Hey everyone, welcome back to the We Fucking Love Startups podcast. I'm your host, Troy Hammond, and on today's episode, we're chatting with David Downs. David is quite famous in the industry. He's been around, he's done this, he's done that. He's currently the Chief Executive Officer at New Zealand Story Group. He sits on a bunch of boards. He's the uh, chairman of the Ice House. He's the chairman of the NZ Tech Awards, which are coming out soon. And so I really wanted to get him on and get some insights from him and, and talk a little bit more about how government and startups can work together. And so we, we chat a lot about this and we chat about how startups can get government funding, how startups can go through the procurement process. And we just get a lot of his knowledge that he's had over the years and, and try to share it with you all in the podcast. And so hope you enjoy this one. I really enjoyed it. Dave's a lovely guy. And so I think you'll find it too. Kia ora. Thanks for tuning in to the We Fucking Love Startups podcast, brought to you by Talent Army. If you were at a barbecue, David, like looking at your background, how the fuck do you introduce yourself? <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I, exactly, because I've been involved and I am involved in many things. So I, I would say I'm sort of a business businessman, consultant, creative growth guy. Yeah. There you go. And was that architected? Like, did you, is that the way? Is that the career that you wanted, or is it sort no, of just how the nothing, chips are falling? No, on? hell no, no. It's complete accident. Well, bits of it now it's more architected. As you, as you get later in life, you do make more deliberate decisions. But earlier in life, you don't make you know decisions. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah. just sort of find yourself doing stuff. Yeah, I can concur with gravitate that. Gravitate to things that you seem to enjoy. Yeah, yeah. I'm in that. Cool. I'm in that space right now. Where oh, yeah. I wake up tomorrow and I'm like, I didn't realize I'd be doing this. Yeah, but, mm. it's like that, that David Byrne song. You know, this yeah. is not my beautiful house. Yeah, man. yeah. So what? Yeah. So what are you doing? Like, what, as it stands right now, what boards and stuff? Uh, you- Ice House. I chair the Ice House. Yeah. Uh, hence me being here quite a bit. Um, that's that's a big one. Venture Talanaki, which is why I'm off to New Plymouth this morning. Yeah. Uh, and Young Enterprise. That was that was why there was this connection last night. Yeah. Um, gosh, what else do I do boards wise? DIA, but internal affairs. Yeah. Um, and then my, and then I've got a full time, and then a couple of charities, yeah. uh, Well Foundation, High Tech, and the High Tech Trust, yeah, yeah. The High Tech Awards, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, there's like there's seven, and I always go, hang on, seven. <laughs> and then I actually got a full time job as well. Yeah, on and top that's of all NZ of that, story. that's the NZ story, yeah. Yeah, and what does NZ story do? We are a government agency yeah. around growing New Zealand's international brand and reputation. So awesome. the, the branding and marketing part of the New Zealand government. So things like the tech sector at the moment, we've got a big tech. Um, international tech story. So, what is the is where the startup stuff comes in quite a lot, actually. Like what is the story we're telling the world about New Zealand as a technology country? Yeah, not just a beautiful place to visit, but a place where you know, incredible talent lives. Yeah, that sort of thing. Yeah. So, and how far how how far in the future do you think it will be that New Zealand becomes the tech country versus the agriculture country? Oh, we're on the cusp now. I mean, there's a. a if you look at agri tech, for example, so the combination of the two, yeah. um, you, you could argue that we're we're seeing the real. I mean, New Zealand's always been a hugely innovative country in the agricultural space. Our our whole history of farming is around the technology that's underpinning the productivity gains. Yeah. Um, and now you've got you know companies like Halter. She Craig was um, speaking last night, who are who are you even more kind of further out pushing the boundaries of what tech can do on farm. But there's so many com- you know companies, but I mean. The tech sector is worth about fifteen to sixteen billion dollars at the moment. Yeah. The agriculture sector is worth about forty to fifty a year. So you still got a way to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, I mean, tech is unbounded. You know, agriculture will have has its natural limits. Do you think government actually is as as aware of that now? Like, for because over the years, I felt like as a observer of the tech industry and you yeah. know, being in Wellington, I've always felt like. If only government knew what we know. Yeah, but I, I feel like they start they in actually pockets. know it now in pockets. I mean, you've got government agencies like Callaghan Innovation, uh, NZTE, etc., who are doing you know amazing work in that area and really get it. Um, yeah, ministers come and go, and yeah. sometimes they know a lot more than some than other times. Yeah. And um, and uh, Good political answer. Mate. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm a public servant. I'm yeah. very, I'm very political. Yeah. Um, but on the whole, on the whole, it has got better. Like you, you definitely can see people realizing that actually, for us, to, and and a lot of it's around two things: um, global consumer sentiment and change in sentiment. So yeah. consumers don't want to, they don't put up with um, issues. They want to understand where things come from and what's the provenance, and then sustainability, and the need for us to really radically think differently about that. Yeah. Those two kind of mega shifts are changing the way that you think about farming practices or the role of. You know, technology on farm, that mm. sort of thing. Yeah. 
Yeah, the, I think the biggest, my biggest concern at the moment in New Zealand in the tech sector is the just the amount of people that are leaving the country and the slow um, nature of how international recruitment has is yeah. coming back now. Because we've got unfortunately a lot of companies and the government was probably a little bit involved in this, where just it, international recruitment just fell off their radar because yeah. COVID stopped that. Yep. And then now the muscle memory of what we used to be doing, like we used to at Telan Army, probably I would say 40% of the people that we would put into jobs and startups would be from offshore. From offshore, yeah. And now it's 5%. And so. Yeah. We, we as a New Zealand story, literally last week launched a, uh, a campaign for international use. So basically we'll do some of the campaigning, but actually we've created a whole bunch of materials for businesses and, and organizations like yourself to use yep. on international talent attraction because of exactly this phenomenon and there, and two big sectors one was the tech sector so as you know we're crying out for talent in the tech sector but the other one is construction and infrastructure yeah. particularly in the high end roles like design engineering you know project leadership that sort of stuff so this is a, like a toolkit of assets that that um, organizations can download and use and then we've come up with a kind of a common activation platform so if you put all your jobs into one platform all the different recruiters working together actually yeah get you guys on it um, and, and then we uh, we as in government are boosting that internationally into some key markets like South Africa, South America, yeah. you know, parts of Asia, uh, where we know that you know a they meet the green list requirements for visas, and b the, you know there's a there's a strong talent attraction for New Zealand anyway. Yeah. And what was interesting, we did a whole lot of kind of quite intentional research in those markets, trying to understand what is the what's the pull factor for someone from South Africa to come to New Zealand, and it's not necessarily the things that we would have naturally gone and talked about things for, for them it's things like safety being able to take your kids to school yeah walk to school it, it, it's stuff like that's quite tactical yeah but actually eating outdoors was another one you know mm. it was like it came out like multiple surveys people go oh we like new zealand because you like us you have the braai yeah i mean oh okay so in the we've got like these nuanced different um versions of the of the information going to different markets yeah we um yeah it's, we, we do a lot uh, obviously in that space yeah. and I, I always find it really fascinating because We'll usually bring someone here, and I'll give you a couple of examples. So we brought out a Brazilian guy once and his family, um, really lovely guy, and he was so grateful. Like he started creating YouTube videos to help us to bring other Brazilians oh, that's out, cool. right? And so he started talking about the differences of New Zealand and you know, oh, Brazil, where he was from. Yeah. And you're watching these things, and you're like, same exact same thing for me. I was like, I never thought about that. Yeah. I never thought about how like such little things for him were such big deals. You know, yeah. he was like, um, what was he, he was like. He goes, this is the first time ever I've opened my window in my daughter's bedroom, you know? And I was like, whoa, whoa, you know, like that. From a pollution point of view or a safety point of view. Both, both. Yeah, yeah. 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 And See, so, it is. It's, we take this, because, you know, the fish doesn't notice the water that it's swimming in. Yeah. We're like that. New Zealand, one of New Zealand's big attributes is we're trustworthy, easy doing business, you know, yeah. least, least corruption, all that sort of stuff. And it's, you know, objectively in the statistics, we're the highest. So therefore, we don't really notice it. Mm. You go to other countries. I've lived in Asia, I lived in Europe. It's different, you know, things yeah. happen differently and you don't understand the rules because there aren't some and, you know, people are on the graft, we just don't have it. Yeah. So when you get to a country like New Zealand, that, yeah, those things are quite yeah. remarkable. Yeah. Yeah, I was talking to a guy the other day actually um, in in South Africa Yeah. and he said to me, and I was, he was like, how safe is it in New Zealand, Troy? And I was like, trying to think about how I could describe yeah, it. Describe and it, I yeah. said, well, the only way I could probably describe it is I know I have a front door key. <laughs> Theoretically, I one don't somewhere. know where it is. Yeah, but I know. And he was like, "What do you mean?" And I was like, "Well, yeah. I, I probably shouldn't. I, I, I definitely shouldn't say this on a podcast." <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I'm known to just like walk out of my door and go to work and come yeah. back and open the door and the lights. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. Um, and you know, like as a as a dad, you know, my kids walk home from school on their own. You yeah. know, they walk home in Wellington, and I and I feel really safe. And you know, obviously, shit still happens. Yeah. But it's as an Aussie moving to New Zealand. 16 years ago it's a phenomenal country to bring yeah. kids up in and to feel safe and to yeah. you know do business the bit, uh, quite often what we've noticed is we're our, a little bit our own worst enemies in new zealanders because we do talk ourselves down a little bit um mm. even just like i did there a little bit you know what i mean like yeah. it's the real it's the kiwi kind of um shyness or lack of wanting to you know boast yeah a and humility is a you know seen as a, a positive attribute but at the same time it can backfire on us because we've got to be a little bit more confident you have to you know, if you're a company, for example, you need to position yourself with with confidence about yeah. your future. If you're trying to re recruit talent, you don't want to be going, "Oh yeah, our product's kind of all right," and yeah, yeah we think we're yeah. goodish, but we're not sure. Because you know, in some markets, that just goes down like a lead balloon. Yeah, 
Yeah. It's funny because I recruited a lot in the States as well. Oh, did you? Yeah. That would have been, whoo. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I still do, right? Yeah. And so, like, <laughs> if I'm recruiting for the same company that has a US office and a, and a New Zealand office, and I like, so I'm looking for a front end developer in the Wellington office, and then they call me and they go, oh, actually, we've got this designer role in San Francisco. Can you call them? And then I go, yeah, cool. And so tell me about the company in San Francisco. And it's like a completely different story. <laughs> you know, we are the greatest in the fucking world we're at this. And you know, every single it. person's a 12 out of 10 that works here. And you know, so, in Wellington, they're like, oh, you know, we've got a oh, Bloomberg. Right. And, you know, it's a co- there's a coffee machine that works most days. And <laughs> I, was, I do, I've been at NZTE for 10 years of part of my career. And one of the, one t- you know, I do a lot of international trips and taking companies offshore and stuff. And one of the trips I remember, this, this is a true story, we had this group of New Zealand businesses who were looking for investment and we're up in Silicon Valley with investors in the room, like a big you know, cocktail function that we'd put on. We had the right people, everything's happening. The Kiwis, first of all, they were all clustering by the bar together. <laughs> the investors are wandering around going, where are all, all the companies that we were supposed to meet? And we go over and go, come on, come on, come on, meet some people. And I grabbed, you almost grabbed one of them by the arm. You know, I knew he was looking for investment. Walk over to this investor guy, and I was like, you know, you know Bob, this is Brian. Da, 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 da. You should hear what you should hear his story. It's great because it's kind of my job as a public yeah. servant, get these things happening. And the investor guys go, okay, yeah, tell me your story. What do you got? And the guy goes, oh yeah, we're all right. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it's okay. What we're doing, it's pretty good. You know, it's just like you could see the investor going, oh, what the hell is this? And like thirty seconds, he'd lost the deal. You know, the guys yeah. wandered off. We're trying to teach them. That you, it's not about lying, definitely, but you've got to have a bit more. Put your best foot forward, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah a little bit more confidence, yeah. I, I'm a big believer in that we as New Zealanders don't storytell well enough, right? Correct. And so for me, everything is storytelling. Recruitment is storytelling. Like if I'm recruiting for NZ Story, yeah. if I don't know your story well enough of your company and yeah. why it's great and it doesn't roll off my tongue, I shouldn't be recruiting for yeah. you, right? And, so, yeah. and if you don't know it well enough, if yeah. you can't tell your story... You know, why would then, anyone get involved? Yeah, yeah, exactly, right? And so Completely it's, agree. it's really about like we hear them now, we hear the um, these origin stories on the podcast of people who have set up these businesses and it's been 10 years of marketing and PR that have changed that story a little bit and it's fantastic. Yeah, And I think early companies early need to be doing that as well like yeah, they definitely. need to understand what's a you know empl- employment brand what's their market you know investment brand and like what's their purpose yeah that's the thing i mean a lot of particularly in startup businesses you know attra- investors or whoever employees you know potential business partners the kind of key people you want to talk to they know that your business is going to change because you're a yeah. startup you know yeah. stuff's going to move what they're interested in is who you are as a person and what's your story and why are you doing what you're doing and what will that see you through all that you know chaos that might happen yeah you know, investors in particular are going has this person got tenacity have they got a sense of clarity around what they're trying to achieve and yeah the product will change or the company might morph but you know if we believe in that you know we'll go with them yeah and that's the same as me as a recruiter right? like i'm a recruiter that works for startups and so you have to be pretty selective about who you yeah. work for right and so maybe you, get paid in advance sometimes yeah yeah <laughs> we, try, we, we try to um and so i have to really pick the right horses if we're yeah. using the analogy from last night right yeah and so for me, I go in and, and I just work next to the founders for the first you know couple of hours and just oh, yeah. just chat with get them. Get the vibe and, of it. Yeah, yeah. And, trying to, and it's really me. I'm buying them, right? Yeah. And, so, yeah. and I get caught up in their story and then I feel like, yeah, that's a story I want to be able to tell. And nice. so, it's, but yeah, man, it's, um, it's, it's an interesting thing. It's hard to judge startups, as you probably know, as a judge yeah. of the high-tech awards, I right? do, yeah. Well, the danger is <laughs> that you almost shouldn't try. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like yeah. um, at the very early stages of business, uh, it is a little bit, not a lottery, that's wrong, but it, but it, the things that, you you know, you can write a business plan and you can write your sales forecast and all that sort of stuff, but it, it actually is probably not the thing that's the most important. It comes back to that the founders, the, the tenacity of the people, yeah. the talent they gather around them, you know, that's the stuff that will see them through. The fact that their forecast looks like a hockey stick, you know, we'll yeah. see that a hundred times. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's funny. Every time I talk to an investor or get an investor on the podcast or, yeah. or talk to someone, they're like, you know, pitch decks you know like they, we, <laughs> there should be a too long didn't read version and there should be the the pitch deck right? that's, right. So, yeah, that's yeah. right yeah 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 nice well i guess like if you were like so if we're thinking about that right you with your experience around what you've done startups governance everything you know what yeah. advice would you give to someone that's in that early stage still in the weeds yeah listening to this thinking how do i get to that meeting where there's going to be a whole bunch of investors <clears throat> because that's probably what i need the most right now yeah it, the, the, the most important bit of advice i reckon is to get advice 
yeah. like seek out some people who you trust, who you'd listen to. And it's it's almost it's interesting because it's almost a countercultural thing for many startups. It's because they're the type of people that that set up startups are by definition unreasonable people. You yeah. know, because yeah. if they were smart, they'd go and work at a bank yeah. or get a job in a life insurance company, whatever. You know, so they're not. They're, they're clearly got a different way of thinking and they want to do something differently, which usually means that they're very tenacious and, and driven, but quite probably quite single minded. And so the great bits of that are, you know, you will keep going no matter what, you'll have that tenacity and, and resilience. The bad bits of it are you'll think you can do everything and you probably don't have the skills to be yeah. a marketer or a salesperson and a product person and, you know, build a company culture and, and, and. And so seek out the people that are going to give you that advice. And in the early stages, you might not be able to afford to hire them, mm. but you can certainly seek out. I and mean, New Zealand's so fantastic to just get advice from people like... I get called quite regularly. I'm sure you do too. About people going, just can I run something past you, or yeah. have you, do you know something about this, or, or can you connect me to this? Person? Can you connect me to this person? Which yeah. you, you usually go, yeah, absolutely, yeah. yeah. LinkedIn, boom, done. You know, yeah. one one jump away. So seeking it out. When I was at um, NZTE, we were helping these sort of smaller businesses who are quite reluctant to get that advice. You know, because they're thinking about having a board or whatever is too much governance, yeah. too much oversight. They're going to tell me what to do and check up on me all the time which is the wrong way to think about it, yeah, particularly in the early stages. Mm. What you're looking for is people around you who have seen seen stuff, been there a little bit, um, can look ahead, you know, can shine so a light like into a your future. Net, right? It's so a safety So you net. can be a little bit risk, yeah, risky, right? You can right. go for it. Yeah, so. like why would you try and do it by yourself? I mean, you could st you still need to have your t own tenacity, but if you can't afford a board or you don't want a full kind of governance board, then just get a, b a bunch of people that you have dinner with every yeah. couple of months. You know, yeah. like I've seen that work really well. Just gather four or five people together, Share some of your stuff with them over dinner and just you get some free advice. What yeah. cost you a dinner? Yeah, yeah. I, I indeed. Like, I'm a massive advocate of this. And and for me, be strategic about who you select too. Yeah. So yeah. if you're a founder who's very technical and it come from an engineering yeah. background, don't get a technical, like, you know, just a technical board. Get That's some right. sales people. Get yeah. some people that have got, you know, new growth opportunities, whatever it may be. And so, if, if people with scars on their back. Yeah. You know, seek out the people that have failed and have gone again or yeah. they have a different way of looking at it or thinking about it. Yeah. So what do you do? Like, talk me through the process. So say Troy at X startup that he's got approaches yep. David and says, hey, David, I want you to potentially come on the board. Yeah. What's your vetting process? Ah, oh, it happens regularly. Um, first of all, do I like the person? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I do have a bit of a sort of a, in my mind, Venn diagram of stuff. You know, like it's got multiple quadrants to it. And one is, is this thing that I'm being asked to get involved with useful, worthy, does it, does it make the world a better place? I know yeah. that sounds really highfalutin but I genuinely believe that I mean I've my stage of you know what I've been through in my life I go right I'm going to spend stuff that's going to actually spend my time on stuff that's going to make a difference yeah second thing is have I got the skills to actually do something about this like I, I mean arrogantly think I do but maybe I don't yeah um so and then the third one is do I like this person yeah. <laughs> will I have fun yeah, yeah. <laughs> because uh it's you important. know I, you know choosing to spend some time doing something probably you know instead of love it's important that you actually get on or, and learn something and if it hits those three, and that's why when I look at my sort of portfolio of stuff I'm working on at the moment, it's very eclectic. You know, the high yeah. tech awards <clears throat> is cool, and then you know some charity work in the cancer space because of my history with cancer, and then you know growing New Zealand through storytelling and, yeah. and New Zealand story. It's a, but all of them hit those hit that bit in the middle. Yeah. Um, the it's and then the other thing I will often do is say right, who else you you know like have you gone to New Zealand Trade and Enterprise? Yeah. Have you got someone from Callahan helping you? Because, uh, you know, part of, I think, with what I know about how you work in the government system, there's plenty of support around, actually. It's like, you know, New Zealand's there is, blessed. There is, but I find that when I talk to startups about it, that they um, they can be a little bit intimidated by going through the yeah. process of working with government. And yeah. they are unsure about how to start the process. And it's not usually until I find them a chief operating officer, you know, and I'm like, as a chief operating officer going through the recruitment process, I'm like, I want you to do start thinking about this, help yeah. them help them look at chatting chatting to Callahan, look yeah. at NZTE, do this, do that. And then they can start realizing that's actually not as hard as I thought. No. Provided. It is intimidating if, <clears throat> if, if you want it to be, but what you'll find is, and, and those, particularly those two organizations, but others as well, like the EDAs around the country and, you know, Creative HQ and Wellington, whatever, <clears throat> Well, inside all of those businesses or companies, organisations, are amazing people. Yeah. yeah, and sure, it's got a big government logo or whatever, but you go and meet a person and you get on well and they want to help you, it's great. And the systems and processes are there just to just to facilitate the fact that they've got thousands of people coming through. The, they're not meant to be a barrier. They're meant yeah. to you know, just make the thing more effective. No, they're great. I mean, I 
I was trying to actually, I, I put it up on social media that I was like, hey, I really want to interview someone in government on the podcast because I want to talk about how government and startups can work nice. better, right? And um, I put it up there and everyone berserk started tagging certain people <laughs> and yeah. next minute, like poor Stefan from, you know, Callahan's oh, good. reaching out to me saying, hey, man, I've seen this a few times. Now people are tagging me. And so he was like, yeah, I'm happy to come on and yeah. talk. Lawrence Pidcock from um, MBIE Chief Procurement Officer. Yeah. He was like, yeah, look, I'm happy to come on and chat. Yeah, you'll find um, that with all of them. I mean, yeah. <clears throat> this is going to sound a cliche because I'm one of them, okay? So well, but public servants are not <clears throat> the grey, boring kind of masses. They're usually, in my experience, really passionate, interested people who want to make a difference and found their way to an organisation where they can actually make a difference. Yeah. You know, like I chose to leave a you know highly paid career in Microsoft and come and work for a government organisation um, because we can have more impact and scale than I could have just selling software. Yeah, and I think we're starting to see that now, right? So we over the last few years, people, it's been pretty you know gangbusters. It's been yeah. crazy. You could make as much money as you wanted in the tech industry. We're starting to see a bit of a reset yeah. now, you yeah. know, which, you know, I'm as harsh as this sounds, it's maybe sometimes needed, right, in the oh, it's industry. The, it's, it is. It's the, you know, the law of the jungle <clears throat> yeah. sometimes. I mean, I've been around long enough to say, oh, God, did I just say that? Bloody hell. Um, but I've seen probably three of these big down cycles now. So yeah. the dot-com boom bust in the 2000s. I had my own tech company back then, and, you know, we went through some pretty tough times. And then there was the 2008 sort of the global recession, and then, and, and then some mini ones along the way, and now we're having, probably going to have another one. Yeah. <clears throat> and the reality is the good, strong, resilient people and companies will do well. Yeah. They'll survive. You know, and, and, and unfortunately, you know, it'll shift and change, and a few people will lose their jobs for a while, and, but it'll come back again. Yeah. Like, it always does. And the, the, some of the better startups that we have now were born out of 2008 GFC, right? Hugely. And so if well, it you, motivates people. It's like it shifts them out of their mindset, you know, being comfortable in this job for a while. Oh, hell, I better do something. All these people that are getting laid off by the big tech companies, yeah. you know, tens of thousands of people, hundreds of thousands probably globally, um, actually it's a really good thing like yeah. for future innovation because they're going to be going, right, like my, I, I'll use an example of my brother who's awesome who's been an engineer at Microsoft for a while, and he's now going, well, why wouldn't I set up my own thing? You know, maybe yeah. I'll do my own thing. And I'm going, wow, you should, because you're incredibly talented. Mm. But, you know, you were safe and, and looked after, and now you're going to have to do something different. So good yeah, on them. Indeed. So like, like Zero is the recent downsizing. Yeah. You know, they, I probably met so many people that were initially, like, really, really scared. And yeah. I kept saying to them, it's going to be good, trust yeah. me, it's going to be good. And now you're seeing them pop up and learn their own startups yeah. or spread the experience across the ecosystem, which is going to help that yeah. next sort of wave again. And so, yeah. so I, I don't mean to yeah, demean or sort of, yeah, play down the impact that we'll have some for some people. But, yeah, I, the history will show that actually it'll we'll look back and go, oh, that was the time to really crack on, yeah. you know, the the – the boom cycle and and agents again go back to the government support and other support like they're all standing by ready to help you know because we know and particularly in the tech sector the new zealand yeah, like you the question you asked earlier about when will we overtake agriculture well it, it's just continuously growing and so mm. more and more good quality companies you know that's the difference actually it's not about more it's about the quality is substantially higher yeah as i said i started up my tech business in 1994 you're, um, you're definitely aging yourself. Oh, mate, I really am. I know, yeah. <laughs> I was I was four, no. 1994, <laughs> and, and, you know, we were, we didn't know what we were doing. The technology was a bit ropey. We were selling stuff that didn't really work particularly well. I think we're past the statute of limitations on my on my contracts. Um, <laughs> you know, we, we were amateurish in what we were doing. You go to today and you see the quality of people and the incredible, you know, just things like the code patterns they can use now and the libraries and the, and the expertise they can dip into. Literally, you know, back then we had the internet, but it wasn't, wasn't used like it is today. It was just email. Yeah. Um, and you could go onto a bulletin board maybe and ask a few chat things. It, it just didn't exist. And yeah. today, it, you know, so much better. Oh, yeah. That's, and that's why everyone was Microsoft developers back in the day, right? Because there was yeah, only yeah. a few Microsoft bulletin boards. That's that right. <laughs> yeah. On a 14K4 dial-up, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Literally, yeah. yeah. Do you ever fantasize about going back and doing it again, mate? Or? I, would, I would love to. Um, I, see, I keep saying to my wife, I might, I might you know, because I'm ready for, you know, Monday I'll be ready for another career. I'm only 52. I think yeah. I've had about four careers in my life, let alone jobs. And I reckon oh, I need another one. Um, and what, it might be going to do a startup again. Because yeah. now I go, oh, God, if I, if I found a really high quality tech kind of, um, you know, CTO. Careful what you say. There's going to be a lot of call, <laughs> calls after this. And, and, I go, and my team will reach out. I know, knowing what I know now, I'm going, yeah. God, you could really smash it, you know, yeah. with the access to capital was so much better now and you know you kind of know how to position yourself and then 
you know, knowing the networks that you can hook into, yeah. it would be quite quite exciting, I think. Yeah. Have you seen there's some data being pushed out recently about the age of founders, uh, over 40 founders, yeah. have a much higher success rate and they're st- uh, I'll have to find it and try and put it in the show notes. I heard that. I heard, um, I mean, that you, it's interesting because at the, the um, event we had last night with Ice House Ventures, they were talking about the average age of founders is young. It's bifurcated, actually. Under thirty, there's quite a few, and then over forty or over fifty, yeah. and it's because in that middle period, you're you know you're having kids and buying right. houses, and yeah. you probably should go and just <laughs> like have a steady income. Yeah. But as you get a bit older, you go, actually, I could go again. I could do something. It'd be fun. Yeah, yeah. As a forty three year old man, it's good. Like yeah, I'm like, well, right, I'm in my prime now. Let's go. Yeah, and do go it, for right? it. Yeah. yeah. No, you know, you you've built up some wisdom. Yeah, yeah. I think that's the key thing, right? That wisdom. You the the information that you've learned over the last five to ten years, you yeah. know, you've got to be able to use that and create that next version of yourself going yeah. forward and choose what you want to do. Yeah. So your um, your wife then says, "Go for it, David." No, she does yeah. not. No, <laughs> <laughs> she's too really too really need to take something else on. Fair yeah. enough, too. Yeah. We, we're, we're not eating noodles, mate. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah oh, I was not quite sleeping on the floor territory, but um, oh, it is, it, I mean, I'm very optimistic about New Zealand's technology community. I like you look around and through the high tech awards, we get this sort of pulse check on what's going on, and and the, it's it's speeding up. The pace of change is speeding up. Um, yeah. I mean, we know the technology pace change is always speeding up, but even the company rates of, of growth, the quality, every year, it's a cliche now, every year the judges go, oh, it's got harder because their quality is so much higher. Yeah. yeah. Can, we, can we, like, without getting into the, how the judging process works, yeah. can we talk about that a little bit? Because I know yeah. a lot of startups out there, when they're trying to go for awards, and I'm always pushing them, get yourself yeah, out good. there, try this, and get go for awards and do all these things, and like Wellington Gold Awards yeah. and stuff are coming at the moment. Yeah. What are what are some of the key things that they should be doing as part of that criteria? Like, is there video like impact yeah. in terms of the video? It can be. I mean, you're right. First of all, that I think getting going for an award is a really good thing to do because, yeah. um, and there are plenty to choose from. And New Zealanders again go back to that point about our sort of shyness. We're not good at putting ourselves out there because we don't think we're quite good enough, or we don't want to be seen yeah. to be showing off. And if nothing, all right, it makes you realize, holy fuck, look at everything I've done. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and and benchmark yourself against some other people and organisations. Um, uh, so it's worth doing. And then some of them get carry real credibility, particularly if you're tra- trading internationally. You know, mm. New Zealand NZTE's got their International Business Awards. Yeah, uh, if you win one of those, or even if you're a finalist in one of those, that means a lot. You go into some markets like Asian markets, yeah. and you say we won this award, but it's from the government. You know, like yeah. ooh, like whoa, you must be credibility. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, and then the high tech awards is the same. Like, so, you know, whether whether you know it, it has a big impact. It's a national. Award. Not many other countries have that. Like, even Australia's got sort of bits of awards around the tech sector, but nothing like the high tech awards that we have here. Yeah. So it's definitely worth it. In terms of, you know, how do you position yourself? Well, I mean, it goes back to, again the clarity of your message and story. Um, a lot of people are probably guilty of overwriting. Like they, they, you know, we have forms and stuff like that. They they need to fill them in. They they don't a, a answer the question sometimes. Yeah. And question will be something like, tell us about your company and why you exist. And they'll start talking about their products yeah. <clears throat> or, you know, or their amazing whatevers. Or, um, we use AI technology. Yeah, 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 that's <laughs> right. Yeah, we're cutting edge. Yeah. <clears throat> no, honestly, there's some words that they constantly use. You know, we're, you know, nothing else like it in the world, <laughs> whatever. Um, <laughs> you know, so you've got to be really careful. But then, so clarity of positioning, making sure that you, you're, you're showing that you know who your customers are, yeah. you know, who are the end consumers of your product, because a lot of people fall in love with the product. Mm. They should fall in love with the, the problem and then the customers. Mm-hmm. Um when it comes to things like should you do extra stuff like videos and things like that, I think that's not always necessary. Yeah. Um, first of all, like as a judge on some of these things, you, you know, you, you've got fifty of them to read. You probably aren't going to watch a five minute video because you've got to get through fifty. Yeah. So you'll read the thing and they might have a quick dip into any of the supporting material. Um, quite a lot of the judges I know do go to the company's website because that's what they publicly say. So yeah. what you've written on the form is what you're privately saying. What are you publicly saying? And do I get it? And it's interesting how often the judges will remark that it's very hard to tell what this company actually does because yeah. <laughs> their, their website on, the website yeah. is just like buzzwords you know yeah. cutting edge you know <clears throat> uh, et cetera et cetera and and not actually really describing the you know the problem they're trying to solve yeah well wow. yeah but yeah. it's not as hard as you think I mean it's it's funny because apparently there's a bit of a cottage industry out there of people who help um, people write award entries yeah. and good on them for doing it. Like, you know, we know about them. That's great. Um, but I don't think they need to do that. I don't think that's necessary. What's the strike rate on those people <clears throat> in terms of getting... The One of them told me the other day that they had a, a something like a 50% hit rate, which is pretty good um, in terms of every, you know, for every company, you know, that, that they put in, half of them get into the finalists. Yeah. 
I thought that's, that's actually pretty decent. Um, I wonder if the that is just because of the company they can afford to pay someone to write their award. Thing yeah, is probably doing a little bit better. Yeah, better. yeah. that's probably it. That's yeah. exactly it. Or yeah, they haven't. Or, or you know, no disrespect, but they haven't given it to the marketing intern to write the awards yeah. entry. They've actually taken this on the CEO themselves, the yeah. founder, who knows the story. It's their it's their soul. You know, when they write it, you can tell. Yeah. Versus someone who's just screen scraped a bit of their internal data and you know stuck yeah. it in a document. Yeah, yeah. No, uh, look, we um, it's award season for us at the moment as well. We we've got a full time employee now that does all that for us. Yeah, nice. GPT. Yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah very so. cheap employee. Oh yeah, like, it's hey, a decent starting point. You know, why not? Well, I, I think for me, it's just like it gives you the bones. Yeah. You know, like in in any time as a small yeah. business, right? Anytime yeah. that you can say, oh, I know what I'm doing now, or even just to say, how can I submit for this award and give it yeah. the criteria? And so, yeah, how um, would you? Given this information and this awards criteria, how can you structure it? Like when you, ChatGPT is amazing. I mean, and so is you know Bard. Now, if you've had a look at that, yeah, uh, because of exactly that, it's it's it, it takes you know structured data, unstructured data, and it turns it into something that you can then really you know gives you a head start. Why wouldn't you? It's a productivity yeah. boost. Yeah. So it's funny. I ran your profile LinkedIn profile really? through ChatGPT, and it tell, and it says to um, and I said, well, what questions would you would you would you ask? Did you really? Yeah, God, I do it, yeah, I do it for everyone just Excellent. because. Um, yeah, and it says, could you explain the role of a governance person and what it does, the traditional values and what you're doing now in a more modern society? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was like, no, no, not, not that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, What else is it? What are the parallels that you see across working in different companies, be them public and private? Oh, oh, yeah, cool. That's good. Yeah. I can ask that. That's a good question. All right, well, good. Let's answer that <clears> one then. Uh, it's funny because working at NZTE has been a real boom, obviously for about ten years, and and in that time, and and so if you don't know, Trade and Enterprise basically looks after about um, four and a half thousand companies that are all trading internationally. Yeah. And of that, you know, fantastic about, too. I love working with NZTE. Oh, they're great, and about fourteen hundred of them very intensively. And when I was there. You know, I was I was working with companies all the time. That's I loved it. You know, it's very even though it's a government agency, we're quite a commercially minded one, and the people yeah. that work there typically are from the commercial world, like me. And so you, you but and, and I had always spent most of my life working in the tech sector, so I thought, okay, everything's going to be different. Now I'm suddenly working with you know carpet manufacturers, helicopter mm. flight training people, food production companies, whatever. And and you notice the similarities and the differences with different types of companies. First of all, the the business models are you know can be different. You know, yeah. you know if you look in the tech sector, it's high capital growth requirements. You know, build a product and then sell it. You know, yeah. through the SaaS models or service type businesses, you don't re- normally get what you do in some other industries, which is very product manufacturing. You know, intensive kind of transformation of product. Um, so the business models can be different. Yeah. Even though, but even then. The company still will have similarities. You know, mm. it's still really important to have you know high quality um, people. Uh, it's important to know who the customers are that you're going to work on. So there's some horizontals across all all, all industries that are common, whether whether they're tech or, or food or whatever. Yeah. Um, and that's just, that's where we sort of spend most of our time is in those horizontals, trying yeah. to get people that yeah I know that you manufacture you know componentry for trucks, but you need to think about who your customers are. Yeah. And you can go to the food people. I know you make, you know, juice, but who's drinking it? Yeah. It's the same question in a completely different business model or industry. Mm. Interesting. All right. Hey, what, one, one thing that I would, um, again, keen for you to comment on, we are, as Kiwis are way more aggressive at going global now, right? And yeah. so if you like, like I see it in Wellington, right. like Fix and Fog, right? Um, oh, good on them, Roman. You know, like smashing yeah. it, Roman. Yeah. I'll try to get him on the podcast, Roman. I've reached you a few times now, mate. Like, Roman, yeah, come answer on. your phone, mate. Yeah. Um, but, you know, like just going after it and I'm, I fucking love it. And yeah. so there's some people that are breaking this sort of mold now yeah. and just saying, we are just going to go for it, <clears> go <throat> big, you know, early. That's what, I mean, that's one big difference between now and when I started 20 years ago, or 30 years ago, in the industry is that people do have higher levels of aspiration, which is fantastic. Because it's mm. arguably, and I think, it, but I do believe this, that our biggest challenge as a country is our level of aspiration yeah. when it comes to growth and businesses and international in particular. Is that if you, if you want to be a $10 million business, you probably will. But if you want to be a $100 million business, you probably will too, you know, yeah. like... Whether you say you can or you say you can't, you'll, you'll be right. Yeah. Um, and so the so companies now who are going out there because and it's because of they've seen the patterns now. Like it was very difficult to say I'm going to grow a billion dollar New Zealand tech company 
but then Rod Jury showed it can be done. Yeah. Yeah. And then Weta, you know, and then yeah. uh, Trade Me, and then, you know, and then Fish and Pockle, and then yeah. Datacom, and then you go, oh, okay. So now it's not a stupid thing to say anymore. And you've got people you can look at that are not a million miles from you that you can probably find on LinkedIn pretty yeah. quickly and get advice from. So that so immediately you you start with that growth aspiration at, at the right level, and then the other big thing is now we've got much more impact driven people and companies. Yeah. You know, I, I don't I don't remember being a sort of a starry eyed, um, you know, twenty year old, but uh, but you know we were just running a business and trying to make a living or whatever. Now you get people go, yeah, I want to run a business, make a living, but I actually want to change the world. Yeah, and that immediately makes you think bigger and you know and they bolder. can change the world without doing it for 20 percent of their salary previously right yeah and so that's right the the big thing that we're seeing now like back in the days if we go back six six seven years ago right i would get 20 percent 20 percent of the interviews i would do that i'd say cool and tell me talk me through your dream job and they're yeah. like well i want to save the world it needs to be something for the environment yeah it needs to be this i need to get paid eight hundred thousand dollars a year and i'm like right oh, the cool. like, let's take half of those <laughs> throw them off the table because you're not gonna be able to do that yeah. what do you really want but now like you know there's some really cool tech companies especially in the environmental space in yeah. new zealand yeah doing well not you're not gonna get paid a million dollars there of course but they're paying Decent money, money now. yeah, or, or stock upsides or whatever it is. Yeah. And again, these models that are now exist that are learning from the best in the world around ESOPs and stuff like that. You know, yeah. so you've got options for where you can, you know, buy in on the on the on the business and its and its vision. Yeah, <clears throat> I, I mean, going back to the global growth thing, and this is why the tech sector is so exciting. You know, I mean, I I work with other sectors too. I work a lot in the food sector, for example, and that's exciting. The tech sector has this global from day one mentality nowadays, yeah. which is really good. Yeah. Like when I, if I meet tech companies and they're they're not thinking that way, it's unusual now. Yeah. Like it used to be the other way around. It used to be, oh yeah, we're going to set up this little business, we're going to sell to this New Zealand based thing, and then we might, might grow. No, ninety percent of them now are going. No, we're going to. This is the market segment we're into. Yeah, we're based in Dunedin, but actually, our, most of our clients are in Europe. Or, you know, it's, that's normal now. Mm. Well, yeah. It used to be kind of and remarkable. And they're moving, right? They're moving faster. So like yeah. where before we'd say global from day one yeah. because we have a little satellite office and our website's got US, yeah. do- US dollars <laughs> written on it. Right? You know, like, um, We've got a dot .com. Yeah. We're global. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now they're like, so they're moving there straight away. You know? Yeah. Like I was, I was chatting actually Aaron from Ask Nicely yeah. who's coming back for the, for the High Tech Awards in Christchurch. Nice. And Good so luck, Aaron. Good luck. Get him on the pod. And, you know, like he, big call, moved to the US, moved yeah. his family there and – like went to San Diego, though Portland, which is like me yeah. in New Zealand. Like, yeah. Not very brave, Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but he just like so the amount of Kiwis that are over there now. Yeah, it's like, huge. Yeah. And again, it goes back to that. There are patterns now ahead of you. You know, someone's laid the path for you. Yeah, you say Portland's big, Denver's yeah. huge. You know, people in Austin, obviously the Bay Area, although that's sort of kind of a little bit off trend now. Yeah. So wherever you go, you'll find support. Uh, networks and people who've been there and done that a little bit before and and you can and that doesn't mean you have to copy them but you can definitely learn from them yeah indeed indeed and so if i guess like if you were doing your startup right that your wife lets you do and then you're (laughs) saying all right i'm going to go global from day one yeah talk me through the process of what you'd do so would you engage like government and callahan straight away yeah yeah i mean gosh if i was doing it now i would start with that um I would start with what I would need for the investment hypothesis, yeah. you know. It's and, in this market especially, would, yeah. you still, would you still do that? Yeah, I would yeah. because, uh, I mean, I, I, I believe if you're going to grow fast and grow big, you're probably going to want to work with people alongside you. And a yeah. lot of people try, you know, and bootstrap companies and good on them, but it's, boy, it's a hard work. I mean, that's my companies that I did back in the day. I bootstrap and yeah. and you're just constantly having to do the wrong projects just because you're getting money or whatever. Yeah. So if I, if I was big and bold now, I'd be going, right, what does an investor want? They want to see a really good team, so get some good people. Yeah. Um, they want to know that you're in a market segment or a, you're attacking a problem that really exists that's significant and has got growth in it. So what's yeah. the total addressable market? So therefore, um, you want to really articulate that. And yeah, they want to know that you've got a decent idea for a product or you know, whatever. Yeah. Um, so that would that, that would be the first step. And then, yeah, quickly go to Callahan first because that's the place where you know they'll start – helping you shape your, yeah. and find product market fit. You know, in the early days, you're still mucking around trying to find out, you know, yeah. have we got the idea to meet the demand? Um, but but yeah, I've seen companies that can do all of that and that whole cycle and then get to NZTE and then start getting some offshore sales and stuff in six months. Oh, wow. You know? I mean, it's that's fast, yeah. but um, the right people... Yeah, like if you if you know if you've got the right people around you, and as I say you're taking the right problem and you're doing it um, collaboratively and you're getting right advice, nothing to stop you moving quickly. Yeah, definitely. So, 
And then like venture studios and everything now, like we are just because I think because we've had some success now with some of those yeah. billion dollar startups that have spun out a lot a lot of people now. Yeah. We have so much credibility in people that are coming into these different little ecosystems everywhere now, like in yeah. government, in ventures and yeah. all these, you know, creative in Wellington, Creative you know, HQ, yeah. Creative HQ is doing Huge. really. They're yeah. in the last couple of months, like some of the events that they're putting on there, some of the things that they're doing. Yeah. I'm like smashing yeah. it. Yeah, and sure. Ministry of Awesome in Christchurch. Yeah, you've got organisations around the country, even in the smaller places. You've got EDAs that are doing, um, you know, trying to do cool stuff. You can have a development agencies. So, so there's plenty. Of, like I said earlier, plenty of support, and people want you to be successful. Like you know, it's a it's a great economy from that point of view. What's the place in Auckland that does it? <clears throat> and oh, oh, sure. we had uh, AUT Ventures for a while. Ice House does it a little bit, but not as much with early stage startups anymore. Yeah. Um, but people like Creative HQ and Moa Ministry of Awesome do do stuff up here as well. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, potentially, there's an infant. We've been talking about this recently. There might be a gap in Auckland actually, because we used to have programs. I mean, Ice House we did programs around early stage businesses. What we discovered is it's it's. A, it's hard because there's it's chaos at that level, as you said, yeah. <laughs> sometimes. Um, and B, actually, the businesses, the good businesses were, were, were getting going already by themselves. Yeah. Um, but no, there's a few people in Auckland, I think, already looking at, like, could we do a bit more? Should we have a bit more of a sort of a venture studio model? Yeah. Um, Auckland Unlimited has been very, very good, I think. And this is disappointing that likely they're... Funding, funding, funding. Their funding is going to be cut in a way that might might mean they not have as much focus on this on this sort of early stage businesses because yeah. I think they've done really well. Yeah, it's interesting. The one trend that's come up through the podcast is every founder has said that they still feel um, a little bit isolated. They still feel a little Do bit, they? you know, yeah. on their own and need some support or yeah. some mentors and the likes of other founders. And and that's. I mean, I do that almost as a full-time job now. You know, like you, you mentioned it before, mm. where people will call me up at nine o'clock at night and go, oh, "Fuck, Troy, who do you know? Yeah. I need some help in this space, and I'll yeah. connect them to this person." I think you're one of the like, you know, I've similar. I mean, there's people like you and I and others that our main, my main job seems to be introducing people to each other. Yeah, because we just, I just happen to know lots of people. When and you're right, the peer mentoring and support, particularly for those founders and you know in the tough stages, is is really critical. Yeah. It, I mean, one of the big things we do at the Ice House, we have a thing called the Owner Manager Program. Slightly later stage businesses, a little bit bigger, but the number one thing they get out of it is just learning from each other. Yeah. I mean, hopefully they get more out of it because we put them in a room and teach yeah. them stuff. Yeah. But actually, you know, we know that it's during the breaks where they're all going, Jeepers, oh, I've got this problem. Oh, I had that problem. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's, and they're, and they're not feeling so alone at the end of it. Yeah. It's, it's interesting that that's like the VC networks that I know they probably put on the best event for founders, you know, like they get yeah. their yeah. portfolio of clients together and yeah. then you just get to unlock the next chapter yeah. of the playbook because yeah. you're meeting someone that's been there and done it before, but we don't seem to be able to do that localized, you know, for ourselves. And so, yeah, I think like, so, um, Creative NZ approached me to find some people around the world that they could fly in and, and do talks and leadership talks, um, which is good. Good gig. Know. But yeah, it's, um, uh, Oh, it's tough trying to find someone to fly into New Zealand for a talk, mate. Yeah. yeah. Especially if they're a big SaaS industry legend. Yeah, yeah. You know, you're like, hey, I'm calling from this country on the other side of the world. <laughs> <laughs> Can I convince you to give up like, four days of yeah. your time? Yeah, no, oh, no, no. <laughs> it'll, so it'll, like, it'll be two days later when you fly here. That's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, uh, but there's something about, I mean, I, I find that um, international people are quite happy to come to New Zealand. Things like Morgo, for example. <clears throat> Jenny's done a great job of getting internationals to come and yeah. spend a bit of time and then they kind of get a bit of the magic of the place. And, yeah. Yeah. Take yeah, the Jenny, down. Like, shout out to Jenny Morrell. Mm. She's, a, she's an awesome human. Um, is, it, is there a Morgo event this year in Queenstown? There is. Uh, I don't know if it's Queenstown or is it up in North and Waitangi? I'm not sure. She seems to alternate them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I've been to a couple of her events. Yeah, they're very they're good. Fantastic. Yeah, and it's same thing again, like exclusive access to super smart people. Yeah, you yeah. Know, like in a relaxed environment because it feels like a bit of a weekend away as well when That's you get right. more go. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And there's other there's other things like that as well. Nurture Change is another one that I'm involved in. Um, a guy called Zach De Silva runs it's in Ho- in Fiji, yeah. and you know lots of businesses come and get a hundred or so people, and the and the speakers tend to stay the whole time because you're in Fiji, and you end up with this kind of really interesting mix of people just you know sitting around the pool talking to each other about business stuff. Mm. I know, yeah, not not super fun for their partners who also tend to come, but you know yeah, it's, yeah, it's, a, yeah. it's a good way. Bring a book. People yeah. Learn, yeah, people <laughs> learn from each other. Yeah, awesome. Hey, so what are what, like. What are the challenges, right? Because now that I've got you on and we're talking about government and stuff, my yep. brain's sort of going to that. Like uh-huh. the challenges and like, what do you personally think that we can do better in terms of getting Kiwi startups yep. into government? Like we, the, 
the and to the procurement piece. Yeah. yeah. So the procurement process is really tough for startups. Yeah. And a lot of the time I see solutions in locally that I'm like, man, we could build that in three to six months. Yeah. You know? yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's been some sort of high profile, you know, examples of, you know, government agencies buying internationally where they could have just bought locally. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Shout out to Ian McRae on that one. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, uh, well, it's it's tough. I mean, I've had, I have some sympathy. This isn't an excuse, but it's sort of an explanation that, you know, government agencies are very risk averse for a reason. Yeah. Um, there are not many other, you know, industries you work in or companies you work for where if you make a mistake or spend a bit of money badly that you're going to be in the front page of the paper and get beaten up by everybody because you're spending public money. Your job these yeah, days. Yeah. yeah, and sadly that means that drives you to be more risk averse and therefore you know buy the safe option or go the safe route, yeah. which is a shame because it doesn't have to be like that. Um, and the good, you know, really good leaders in, business, in government agencies will encourage their organisations to take you know smart risks and appropriate risks. You know, I work for Trade and Enterprise um, for many years. We're great CEO. He's still there, Pete Crisp, and he's. Pete is, you know, very much about, look, we have to be a little bit different. We have to take a few risks. Yeah. Um, yes, we might every now and then get it wrong. And if we get it wrong, we have to learn, we have to own it, and then we have to learn by it. But <clears throat> that shouldn't force it. it should, you know, that's that mentality of not taking risks, just be, you become grey and boring. Yeah. So, you know, that risks can be things like hiring people who are a little bit out of the box, who, you know, think differently, or can be like backing a company into a market where, you know, it, it's unclear whether they're going to be successful. Yeah. Um, but if you go back to that procurement thing, <clears throat> if you are selling into government, first of all, you got to realise that there isn't one thing called government. Government has got multiple parts to it. Like a yeah. lot of people just go government, and they mean they mean the politicians. Yeah, that's one part of government, sure. But actually, they they actually don't have that much to do with the operations of they government. They cycle in and out. Yeah, right? they They're cycle in and out on a very not even a three yearly basis these mm. days because they keep hitting cabinet reshuffles and we keep getting a new person. It's quite quite hard yeah. <laughs> when you get a new minister all the time. So you've got to think about government as being, yeah, you've got to touch them and make sure that they that they agree with, philosophically agree with the idea of buying local or whatever. Yeah. But then it's the public service layers that you've got to really understand how to work, you know, the, the senior officials, um, <clears throat> which is like me. Yeah. I didn't know I was a senior official, but one day I was on, I was, there was a th an item on the news and one of the ministers said, yeah, I was meeting today with some of our senior officials to talk about that. And I went to my wife, oh, that was me. I must be a senior <laughs> official. I didn't know I was. <laughs> so, anyway, so anyway, there's that layer. And then there's the actual people who are on, you know, doing the do. Yeah. Um, and, and you kind of need to have a strategy on all three. Yeah. You know, it's not enough just to say, we've got a great product. Hey, Mr. or Mrs. Politician, why aren't you buying it? Well, A, they don't buy it. Uh, and B, even if they wanted to, um, they can't force an agency to do it. So you've got to do the what we call the rugby tackle, going at two two levels at the same time. Yeah, the, the, it's yeah. a rugby league. Um, and then and then what are you going to do to mitigate that risk? If you think about again, if you're selling into government and you know they're risk averse and it'd be much safer to buy one of the big offshore things, how are you going to help them understand how you can mitigate that? How are you going to show them you've got the post sales service? Yeah, you've got the team that can back it up if it goes wrong. You know that you um, have quality built into the product. Yeah, those are things that start to make them a bit more relaxed. What's your thoughts on consortiums getting together to be able to offer that level of support? Yeah, it's huge. Good, it's a great idea. Mm. Kiwis aren't particularly very good at that, in my experience. Yeah, <laughs> not not good at not doing it. It's just not. It's not common. Yeah. And it goes back to that kind of mentality thing about New Zealanders, the t types of people who set up businesses are typically kind of bloody-minded and single-minded and you know, I can do everything and I've, I did a bit of coding and now I'm selling it and whatever. Yeah. And that doesn't help, you know. So, But if you can work out a consortium model where you go, actually, we've done a really good product, but we're not going to have the, the sort of people that build good products and not the people to maintain yeah. you know, ongoing relationships. We need a different type of person and we're not going to hire them. So how about we work with you, company X, and you do that bit and we'll do this bit. And mm. Yeah, that that I think that can work really well. Yeah, interesting. But we saw the Yola Government Recruitment Services one recently. Oh, yeah. um, and I, I know a bunch of smaller agencies that went out and did consortiums. Oh, good. Didn't get on, many of them. Oh, really? Yeah, and so... A lot of big Australian and global and smaller Kiwi companies yeah. got on that individually were embedded. But I would say if you're going to do a consortium, make sure it's really clear that the government agency can have a single point of contact for yeah. it. Um, I mean, that, that's probably what our fear would be. Oh, now there's six companies. I don't know who I'm going to deal with. They're all going to be pointing the finger at each other. If you say, like, I'm the lead contractor and I'm going to subcontract these these guys, that'd be, that would work. Yeah, awesome. Hey, who do you think, who would you like to see on this podcast? Oh, so many people. Founders, yep. lots of founders. Uh, Craig from Halter, because yep. he was there last night. He was 
excellent talk last night. Yeah, I've seen him talk at sun, um, Sunrise. He's, yeah. This is great. Love to get him on. I've yeah. tried, to, tried a few times. Come on, Craig. Yeah. He was here last night. He could have just grabbed him. Yeah. Um, uh, you've got like Emily from um, Emily Blythe. Yeah. You know, all the, all, I'm just thinking about the Ice House people because yeah, I sort yeah. of see their pictures as I walk up and down the hallway. What, what do we call that? John, a recency bias. Yeah, yeah. We, we, yeah. We but then it? if yeah. I was you, I'd also get out to some of the, some of the regions. Like as I say, Taranaki, I've got a bit of a bias there because I'm on the yep. EDA board. But there are companies there like Morag from Boring Oat Milk. Amazing. Yeah. I did yeah. a podcast with her recently. Amazing story. Yeah. of growing an oat milk company, which is not what you'd think of as a tech company, but boy, it's got very yeah. similar attributes. So I've, I've read about two, like last night I was reading, because I'm looking for those people now, so yeah. I'm trying to look for people that we can spotlight and give a bit of a platform. Mm. Um, I read about, I've, I've known about Maureen, I read about two Māori fellas last night that are doing this um, electricity company in Hamilton somewhere. Oh, yes, yes. Um, the other ones you mean? Yeah. yeah, like, and yeah. now like, um, like little ones are popping up sort of everywhere and we, we're now doing what we call Fuck Year Fridays. I'm not sure if you've seen it where yeah. we just shout out small in the, in oh, the week startups every Friday. Yeah. And it's just, it is so cool seeing. I'll flick your list. Oh, yeah, man. Um, like, yeah, and, and some of them are, in, as I say, food food startups are really interesting. Yeah. I, don't, I mean, it's sort of, again, tech people go, oh, food? Food has got well, When I say startups, amazing. I mean yeah, anyone building everyone. A, a business, right? <clears throat> yeah. So it doesn't have to have tech lens. There's a it. really organi- interesting organization called Future Foods Aotearoa, which yeah. is a collaboration, it's sort of a support network, if you like, of these early stage food businesses like the Chia Sisters and Aripa yeah. and, and a bunch like that who are, who are, in their, you know, sort of 20s, 30s, 40s, setting up these really innovative food companies, learning, working together. Um, yeah. And often they've got a kind of a um, future focus. It's, you know, it's it's like functional foods, like Aripo's, you know, brain yeah. health and things like that. <clears throat> That's a good, those are good people to talk to. Yeah, I've tried um, Aripo guys. Yeah. yeah, they definitely can. Yeah, cool. So, but yeah, no, it's, um, it's, it's a really cool time to be in New Zealand. I th- I'm... Like in New Zealand startup ecosystem, yeah. I'm I'm really excited about the future. Like yeah. a lot of people are a little bit weirded out now in this weird market, but I'm like, hey, I'm old enough now to look at it over yeah. a ten, ten year lens and say, yeah, hey, you know, everything's this is be the great. time. Yeah, this is where you start building. But this is the time to. It's going back to kind of a key thing we've seen a few times now. Go, make sure you've got the people around you to support you for this. This next year might be a bit weird sales wise or whatever. Make sure you've got your investors behind you. Make sure you've got, you know, support people and, and strategy and you're thinking right and you're investing and take this time to invest in, you know, really developing the product or understanding your customers better or mm. whatever. Um, but don't shut up shop. No, this yeah. is this is the time to, that, we, you know, five years from now we'll look back and go, oh, that was, it's like, when you, you know, buying a house in New Zealand. Ah, oh, five years ago was always the best time to buy a yeah. house. Like... <laughs> Now, now is the time to do these things. Yeah, indeed. It just it just changes the, the how we look at it now. Right? Like yeah. it's not going to be hyper growth by raising money every twelve months. You know, it's no. I think be... you'll find you find yeah raises might be a bit more difficult. It's not more sort of money going into follow ons rather than you know initial raises. But yeah, I still think it's good. You know, good businesses will find the right backers. Yeah. Um, you look at Henry, they didn't struggle raising their Series yeah. B, right? Like, yeah. So you've got good metrics. you yeah. got a good metric. I mean, you talk to people at Ventures, Ice House Ventures, um, they'll, be a, they'll be cautious. They won't just be filling up for the sake of it, but they'll, but they'll be looking for the same things, good people with yeah. good ideas and good markets that can grow. Mm. What do you, what's your take on it? It feels like to me that the um, physical products and food tech and the like things are starting to like – take as much spotlight as SAS yeah. at the moment. Yeah. Oh, here's me. I have a controversial opinion now. I think that's a good thing. Yeah. I think we over-indexed on SAS for a while. I mean, SAS is an interesting business model, um, and it's for the right solution, it can be fantastic, but the whole world does not need SAS. You know, we don't yeah. need another. So, so it says me the other day, oh, the world does not need another product to help you find your friends at a bar. Um, <laughs> what we need are products that are going to change, you know, climate impact or you know yeah. are going to help you know reduce inequities or whatever so going back to more fundamental things is probably a good thing and mm. if your SaaS product does that great but but you know I, I i get quite despondent when i looked and nfts was another one they seem to have come and gone pretty damn quick didn't they but i looked at that whole sort of bubble and went oh all those smart people putting all this effort into something that really is just sort of sugar rush yeah, I said it's terrible. I shouldn't be criticising oh, it, but I I describe SAS as a sugar rush. Whereas you want something more sustainable with a, with a with a you know more GI you know low GI food that's going to really go for a long period of time. Yeah, just building you know a, a product that makes bunnies or whatever. Sorry, Brooke, love it, but boy, yeah. 
Um, make money when you can. Good. <clears throat> Spend that money doing something really meaningful later. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel like there's something really majestical about the legacy of something that's going to stay this like, yeah. length of time, right? In terms yeah. of, you know, a physical product or whatever it may be. Yeah. Or food. Like food is a really good, interesting place to be in, right? Food's and- huge now. I mean, it's. I was with our minister yesterday, on name dropping, but we were talking about sort of the fundamentals behind New Zealand and he quite rightly keeps pointing out, look, it comes, it does come back to human health and nutrition and food, you know, yeah. like, and we can talk all about this stuff and it's all good, but we will always need to be a country that produces a lot of really high quality food that feeds more people than we have living here. Yeah. That'll always be a fundamental. So the, I, I do get frustrated because there's this sort of narrative and you almost touched on it earlier of like, We've got to get away from it. No, we don't. We have to grow other things. Yeah. But we'll always have this core of New Zealand as a massive. Think, just don't yeah. be so reliant on it. Yeah, right? exactly. Like, Can't yeah. have a single leg yeah. to the stool. Yeah. Um. But you know, being that being a part of the world that that nourishes millions of people is a pretty worthy thing to do. Oh yeah, shit, yeah. And I think New Zealand is poised because of our history and our you know emotional intelligence in this country to yeah. do that. Right. And yeah. So, yeah. Hey. Um. In the podcast, we normally finish on one particular question, which you won't have seen yet because Uh-oh. season two hasn't come out okay. yet. Season um, two, but um, we try and we're trying to give something like a little nugget of wisdom to yep. people, you know, that are watching or listening to this. And so, in the show notes below, there's, we're going to give give them something from you, whether it be a book, whether it be a podcast, nice. whether it be a link that they should go to, whether it be a person that they should just look into. Yeah. And so, what's cool. that little nugget that you would be like? Hey, this this has done something for me, and someone might find something really, you know, good out of this. Wow, that's a big question because there's so much to it. Um, I, I, one thing that I have really got a lot of value out of lately is learning Tareo. Yeah, and I know that sounds like oh, very worthy. He's that government guy being all woke, but honestly, a learning another language is a gift that we should all try and get. Um, but B. Uh, but there's just this renaissance in New Zealand about thinking about our culture and who we are and what we stand for and you know and you know some of the conversation we had today is about our our sense of identity. Yeah. You know, it's kind of my job to think about this stuff too, which is cool. And and what what you discover if, when you start learning Tareo is it's it is it, it answers some of those questions for you in a funny way. Like it, it's it's a poetic language. Like you, you know the way that it describes things is valuable. And so yeah, I found that really valuable. Me and my team at New Zealand Story have been going on this kind of course thing. Learning about new, um, about Maori culture and, mm. and language and and myths and legends and stuff and it's just so rich when you get into it. Tara is so beautiful at storytelling too, mm. right? Like, oh, it is. Yeah, that's what I love about it. as a storyteller. Like yeah. when, when you start to, and I'm way I'm really still very early days learning, but you realise that the way you describe things is poetical and 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 you know story is a big yeah. part of it. And and then we did this module recently. So this is not the little snippet that you're wanting, but it, but it was yeah. really good talking about the Maori myths and legends of creation. And mm-hmm. what you realise is, you know, on one hand you can say, oh yeah, Maui we fished up the sea or whatever, but actually there's a lot in it about what did that tell them about how the world was round and how. Um, when when you're sailing, you know, and land comes towards you, it looks like it's coming out of the sea, and yeah. and the, and the slowing down of the sun was an attempt to ast- explain astronomy and how the stars and the sky works and why did the sun go f- um, more and sometimes the year and less than others. And yeah. so while we get the trivial versions, actually the deeper versions have got story and wisdom built into them. So yeah, and and learning that you know through the lens of um, in New Zealand, I'm a, I'm a sort of na- a ta- a tanga tatiriti, so mm-hmm. born in New Zealand but not Maori. And, and always kind of curious about it, but at the same time a bit shy because, you know, when you're in the born here in the in the 70s and, eight, and 80s, and, you know, you don't really, you're not sure how to navigate it. Yeah. And it's becoming much more, I suppose, accepted that we should be navigating our own culture and history and, and be proud of it. So, yeah. yeah it's it's, a, it's a nuanced conversation there, right? Because I'm, I'm, I'm exactly like you, right? I'm, and as an Aussie who grew up in Australia where we were terrible, yeah. you know, like yeah. the Aboriginal community, I... I like fuck thank god we finally at least said sorry you yeah know, with john howard and starting to do things now and like understand the land and where it's yeah. come from and the likes but when i moved here i was like this is how it should be done like you know yeah. like it's you know like i feel like the communities here um were much closer and obviously there was some work to do of course yeah but yeah. it feels like it's getting to back to like bilingual country now where you know you could speak either and the likes i yeah. hear people occasionally in the, you know, in the supermarket yeah, it's, saying, Throw, and yeah. it's like you know, it's it's cool. I um, love it. Yeah. But it also, like, I see a lot of people who are like big, 
like Mari leaders and the likes who are a little bit annoyed by the tokenism use of yeah. the, uh, Toreo. That's in- the challenge, eh? Tokenism or, or um, colonialization of language again and and you get it. I mean, it's a tension. You know, yeah. we're not perfect, that's for sure. So we've, but we've got to we've got to go towards it. And the more people that do put a bit of effort in and learn and you know put out their products bilingually, or whatever, yeah. it's going to help. All right, we'll get, we'll shout out in the show notes with the place that you're doing yeah, cool. Toreo for that people yeah. can go off and look. Hey man, thank you so much for coming in. I know you're a really no busy worries. guy. We had to do this first thing in the morning. Super know, early. Yeah, it was, <laughs> we're meeting for coffee at like 7 a.m., you know, kicking onto it. But no, hey, really awesome. appreciate you coming, mate. Hey, enjoy um, Taranaki today and have fun. Oh, well, keep telling the good stories. Cheers, mate. Thank Kia you. Cup hi, David. That was a really, really interesting chat. I um, actually really enjoyed that. You 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 know it's you often chat with people in government who can't talk too much about what they do can't be vocal can't be open and and i think david was really really good in terms of his knowledge his advice how we can improve things what he's doing uh the mana that he has in terms of what he's doing and the storytelling and helping the industry and and why he can be effective on boards and what he can do and so yeah, really love that people are coming on at david's level and giving us all this information and i hope that if any early stage founders are out there thinking about how they can do things, how they can get better access to government, how they can get better, quicker grants, like David mentioned. You know, I hope it's helping you. And so, and to everyone that's watching and listening and loving and, and talking about it, thank you so much. So many people are commenting now on each post. They're sharing it with friends. They're tagging other people that we should get on the podcast. They're obviously subscribing, which is making us blow up and get bigger and bigger and bigger. And so, yeah, I thank you all so much and um, you're the reason why we're doing it all. And so until next time, thanks for watching. This podcast is produced by John O'Tucker from Empire Films.